one foot away. Yeah. Add into X. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, playing a proper set. Yeah. That yeah, was really wild. It was being. It was for a kind of broadcast. My name is Elizabeth, and I make music under the name of Gazelle Twin. I'm John Fox, and I make music under the name of John Fox. <laughs> my name is Robin Rambo. I make music under the name of Scanner. Uh, my name is Benj. Uh, I run the studio here and make music as Benj and working with John as the maths. One of my main problems with performing pre-Gazelton was that I would I'd be making this music that was quite sort of cinematic and quite dramatic and quite you know intense or willingly intense but um, if I was performing it on stage as my as Elizabeth I'd kind of have the tendency to be oh thanks in between songs and oh, you know really kind of it just I just felt wrong it just felt really restrictive and uh, immediately when I started wearing costume and covering my face it's just I just felt an immense freedom that was one of the deciding factors of even beginning as Elton was that it wouldn't be me it yeah. would be not an alter ego, but it would be like something that I could just change when I wanted to. And like you said, have a blank canvas. I had no, no idea what you look like in real life. And with that sort of costume, there was a sort of quite a power to it. You didn't know whether there was this sort of enormous boast of energy about to flout your head and impale someone in there. <laughs> <laughs> there are all kinds of other connotations, aren't there? There's the, the, that shamanic stuff and all that, which is true and it's relevant you know and it, it it also gives you the opportunity to step away from your old self mm -hmm. and that can be good for you because that's often burdened down with a lot of um, baggage that you've gathered through your life and you see people who don't understand it and die sometimes because of it because they confuse themselves with the object that they're creating if they think they are that object it usually kills them so it's quite an interesting lesson to learn and I've seen a lot of people do that I had to go on tour to promote a record and the thing people have to do and you know this you guys when you make a product the idea is is that you promote it and I simply wasn't interested in it and I'd already made a tour and thought I have no energy for this so I used lookalikes and I had 16 people who looked a little bit like me but they made the show on one night so I made 16 concerts, one in Amsterdam, one in Vienna, one in Miami, one in New York, one in London, with people who looked a little bit like me, at the time shaven-headed, skinny-looking creatures. And they just played in dark clubs, and nobody had any idea, was that scanner, because people weren't really sure what I looked like anyway. And that was a great way of using this kind of anonymous quality, and as John said, taking on this different persona. Synthesized music's often described as cold and inhuman, or, or what have you. Do you think there's a coincidence there? Is there something about synthesising electronic music that kind of allows you, allows you to create these distances? Electronic music's often connected with science fiction and so on. So there is that feeling of, of distance and alienation, you know, is the word that's used all the time. So that, there is that connotation, that connection there. Um, the other one is just new stuff. Uh, when you haven't figured out a language for it, it seems alien. And I think synthesizers were like that too. You can, actually, in fact, with a synth, you can make the warmest sound you've ever heard in your life, and the most intimate sound you've ever heard in your life, and the most uh, immersive sound you've ever heard in your life too, much more so than you can with a guitar, I think. Originally, for me, it came loaded with no history, in a sense, in that when I was looking at acoustic music, and I played a note on a piano, it came with hundreds of years of music already there in that one note. When I hit a chord, it was even more history arriving at, at, your, at your kind of memory and your hearing and everything at the same moment. Whereas what appealed to me about electronic music, particularly sampling actually at times, was the, not only the manipulation of the real and the unreal and this division between what is real, what isn't real, but also being able to create something that's never existed before. A lot of the equipment that's here was the sort of thing that people were kind of chucking out a few years ago. It's only in the last sort of few years that people have started to pick up on it again. It's got this value still to it and, and yet people discard it and move on to the latest kind of gizmo, you know, the kind of gizmos that you're making, mm. which is fantastic. But I, I like to appreciate the, the kind of the previous generation in a way, the stuff that had been discarded and, and uh, 
forgotten about and kind of that's where, mm. where it, I am here. It got thrown away too quickly though, didn't it? That's, yeah, That's absolutely. the thing, because it never got investigated properly. The original recordings when, when this stuff was originally brought out in the 70s and 80s and stuff, it was all recorded on tape and it was quite it was quite lo-fi and noisy in a way, that kind of recording medium. But now, <coughs> with, with kind of high high resolution digital recordings, you can just hear every little mm. kind of nuance of these old instruments that you you couldn't really hear back then. And mm. and uh, I think it's it, it kind of it's almost like you, you're listening to them with new ears. You're dealing with archaic control mm. interfaces, you know, like that, or like a typewriter which has been adapted, and neither of them really suit the purpose perfectly. Um, and we're dealing with scales that were invented for piano for various reasons, mm. so there's a lot of historical baggage. And once that's got rid of, we'll, then we'll get some new instruments. Um, we're not far off, I think. But at the moment, it's interesting that even the software is imitating this. Mm. So we're, we're, we really are in Formica land at the moment. You know, we're, we're how Formica imitated wood when it came out. In studios, we used to use um, uh, iron dust embedded on uh, melted ancient forests um, as, to, as a recording medium, which is not far removed from walls or rocks or stone or whatever. And in fact, it is mineral uh, mostly. Um, so if that can be done, then I think there are lots of interesting possibilities that haven't even really been looked at yet. When Elizabeth made us this YouTube and various and sound mix, like, which we could then install on the website, and it was almost like that's kind of like a, a Heath Robinson sort of proto version of something you might be able to do in a kind of more vivid way. And I, I thought it was really interesting how you put it together. Composing classic for classical music, and you know, there's always a, a connection with literature, and there's always, I mean, there is with all music, but that was always of interest to me to try and combine and everything um, from all, all sources and I don't know whether I've always done this but for, for Gazelle to and what I write for that project it's always intentional that I'm trying to include everything that I possibly can that has any resonance with me so that I mean that can come from anything and you know I think that the, the playlist that I made for the choirs was very specifically about you know um, sort of post-apocalyptic kind of situations and you know there's literature that's about that, you know, from way beyond where I thought, you know, like the, the Mary Shelley piece, The Last Man, which is one of the first, I think, that I know of that's about, you know, post-apocalyptic earth. I studied literature, and so when you're trying to make comparative literature in a sense, in a similar way that the mix was made, you're looking at a history of ideas, you're looking at politics, you're looking at visual arts, you're looking at the literature, the poetry, the social conditions, and you're trying to tell a story with words that's joining all these things together. And it's changed quite a lot today. I mean, in that you could type the word dystopia in, and all these images would pour down. L website links would, would pour in, in a sense. And you can make the connections. And I find it really intriguing. I wonder how this is changing the thought process mm. and changing how we're actually I'm sure it does. Enga yeah, engaging in media mm. and how we're actually remembering these things. Mm. I mean, I, I've read discussions recently about how do we remember things anymore in some sense you know mm. because it's always stored there mm. any any anyhow like McLuhan said we're external we're busy externalizing our nervous system at the moment I think it, you can look at the all the cultural and and even uh, scientific history of the human race as as an unconscious desire to connect everyone together in, by some means because all the technologies have gone into communication all of them or warfare, but that's communication of a different kind. It's destructive communication, but it sure is communication. If you throw a spear at someone, you're connecting with them. We are on this ocean of information, and we are surfing it to s survive. And trying to learn the rules again of mm. what's right, what's wrong, mm. where your responsibilities are, how far do you go, yeah. yeah. What do you reveal and what you don't reveal, which mm. kind of goes back to where we began yeah. and taken identities not to reveal too much. Mm. And that's what's really curious, what, you know, how do you use these tools, etc., mm. etc. I don't know if it's because I grew up in the 80s and there was lots of films about, you know, um, like Terminator, think, you know, machines taking over and aliens invading. I mean, I think that that's always been there and I was saying earlier about literature and there's always been a fear of invasion and a fear of mm. losing control and lo losing what's human or not really understanding well, what, what being human is. Fear of industrialization, fear of science, fear yeah. of 
possibilities of electricity for yeah. its rest of which is what it all comes from isn't it and yeah, yeah it's interesting about synth- synthesizers and just the whole essence of recorded music or well, maybe not obviously those wax and things before but you know it all comes from the spark mm. and from fire and you yeah. know, yeah, that goes all the way back to you know the beginning of yeah. civilization 